Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Conversations of the Strange. I am Don Everett Smith Jr., your host, and I am on the phone with one of the nicest guys around and just an all around fantastic uh, movie maker. And we are going to talk about his brand new documentary, A History About the Halloween Costume. And I am on the phone with Rob Caprolozzi, and we are talking about his documentary Halloween in a Box. Rob, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. I got to ask, it's a couple of days after the fact and uh, we were going to do this before Halloween, but of course, as always, life gets in the way of all kinds of things and and as they say, um the best laid plans of mice and men things just didn't work out but instead of saying okay let's release this for halloween i can ask you how was your halloween rob did you do anything special uh you know what it's here in connecticut we we got really bad rain and uh so they were thinking about canceling uh you know trick-or-treating and delaying it so uh i really didn't do anything except for hang out watch movies on tv and my doorbell rang once and we had two trick-or-treaters, and that was it. Well, what were the trick-or-treaters wearing? Uh, you know, one, it, it, was, it, it wasn't it was the best. Let's put it that way. I think they were 11 years old, and I, I think one, one person had like a half a face painting, and I don't even really know what the other one was, and, and that was kind of it. So it really wasn't, wasn't a banner year here. Gotcha. Did you want to say anything to them about who you are in the movie you made? You know, I mean, I was just happy. I mean, we we live in a my wife and I live in a condo association, and and last year the doorbell did not ring at all. So I was just very happy to have someone at the door, no matter what they were wearing. Someone came by and rang the doorbell, and you know, I was considering like starting up a reverse trick or treating thing this year, where I put on a mask going to people's door and giving them candy just because no one <laughs> seems to trick or treat here and uh, I may have to start doing that next year if, if this trend continues. That's hilarious. Well, one of the things that's um that's interesting and a lot of, a lot of people talk about this is is that you've got the what what is now you'll see a lot of people do what they call trunk or treating. Uh towns will do this, churches will do this, um certain organizations will uh, get groups of people together and they open up trunks in a parking lot someplace, decorate them in weird ways, and then pass out to the candy that way. And it's less and less what you see in neighborhoods anymore like that. It's not like, I'll tell you this, I'm, I am 45. I'm going to assume that you are past 25. We're the same, we're the same age. We are. Okay, great. Yep. So you knew what that was like it, that like I, I think it was like trick-or-treating ended with us like the golden age yeah. of trick-or-treating ended with us right you put on a costume le- uh, as soon as school gets out and then you're there until like you're out until like nine o'clock or something getting cos getting candy the joke is i came back home put on last year's costume and went back out to get more candy <laughs> type of thing and, that sounds about right yeah and um it seems like it ended with us that that and then I don't know what it was reality crashed down in some regards the um, the uh, the medicine scare and people talking about putting razor blades and things and it just just seems like trick-or-treating just kind of was not what it used to be in some regards yeah. That you know, that's absolutely right. I mean, if, a few things like uh, number one is is uh, you know when when they started saying because of the uh, torrential rain here, they were talking about moving Halloween. I'm like, come on! I was like, is it you know you got to go out? I remember going out and you know living in Connecticut, you'd have to put your outfit over your your winter coat and uh, you know you know you'd go out there in the rain whatever you know just to to go out because it was halloween you know having having them you know say they may cancel or move to another day it's like come on you got to go out there and and uh get the candy and go door to door no matter the weather but um yeah i mean i know what you mean in terms of all the scares and, and this is actually pretty interesting because someone they actually just arrested someone today in connecticut uh, who lived in Waterbury for putting razors, I guess, in someone's Kit Kat. And so they actually just arrested that guy 
and um yeah it's 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 a it's a sore subject you know now now who knows what's going to happen you know more people are going to be scared to go out trick-or-treating and it's uh it's it's just sad yeah well in the, and you actually talk about this very thing in the um, in your documentary, uh, Halloween in a Box, which basically deals with the history of uh, it deals with the history of uh, Hall- the Halloween costume, how it went from being like you know, you know like makeup and potato sacks that kids would wear and design to cartoon characters and popular characters that people wore all the way up to it becoming something that adults would wear and how it's gone from being like you walk into a Toys R Us and you see the big display of cartoon character Halloween costumes all the way to now where um, uh, like a closed down department store gets opened up for about three, two or three months at the end of summer uh, from like Labor Day to Halloween and they have all of their um uh, selling Halloween costumes and stuff like that, and your yeah. documentary deals with that. I've always been a, a huge fan of, of horror and Halloween. You know, um, thinking of Halloween's past, it always you know brought me really fond memories because I remember going out. My dad would take me out trick or treating, and you know, I mean, you know, as, as we both mentioned earlier, we're, we're in the same, we're the same age. Mm-hmm. So it, at that point, you know, you'd always see those costumes in a box, and there seemed like there were hundreds of choices that you could be. And and looking through those boxes were, were some of the coolest things because you know you you just keep moving boxes, and there's different characters from different you know cartoons and movies and and everything else you can imagine. Uh, and, and so I always. To me, the the cool thing was I love looking at vintage Halloween photos, you know, from like the 50s to the 90s. Uh, it's it's something. Some of them are really creepy while being really cool looking at the same time. And you know, I remember growing up being like Spider Man and Godzilla and the Wolf Man and a few other you know things. And and you know these you know these things held fond memories to me and you know i thought that there there has to be other people out there like me that remember wearing these costumes and and it brought back like a really good time from their childhood so i wanted to um do a story about it and and basically you know find out more information on these companies and and i basically you know went through and and that's kind of where it all started that Right. How much um, prep work did you have to do for this? Because I would imagine that that on the days that you filmed, like I'm going to take a shot in the dark that and kind of like I kind of imagined what the production was like on the other side of it. And what it struck me as is that you probably had to do at least a good five to six months of prep work before you actually did your filming and then you probably filmed over the course of I'm going to guess about six weeks then of different people as you got their interviews and how you did that and then you probably spent another several months editing it all together uh, am I correct on that? Yeah well this thing actually took me four years to put together oh is that uh, all? <laughs> it was uh it was pretty you know the thing is so so this is the thing you have to remember that the documentary focuses on ben cooper and collegeville and, and the other player in the game which was halco halco went out of business in basically the late 70s um cooper and collegeville both went out in the early 90s and that was kind of pre-internet you know and and so it's hard it was hard tracking the people that owned these companies down uh, you know, at that time, both of these the guys that I found, you know, when were in, are in their late seventies, uh, so you know it, it's really hard to to even find them. And then the second thing is, it was hard to because both companies basically went out on a on a sad note. Right. You know, they they basically you know went out of business. So when I did get in touch with them, it was in convincing these guys to talk about the business you know they didn't i mean probably most people if they have a business that goes under their they don't have 
warm feelings to talk about what happened. So, you know, I had to let them know that I, this was like kind of a labor of love and I wasn't doing this to, to, you know, say, okay, they went out of business because of this. I just wanted to bring back like fond memories for other people. So, um, that was that. So, and then it was just a matter of getting them to, you know, meet with me and then film and then, uh, you know, getting, uh, pictures of, of, you know, I have to rely on, uh, them to wait and dig up photos of Ben Cooper. And, and then I had to, uh, you know, the, so there was obstacles along the way and, and, um, you know, something cool, which started to happen is people started reaching out to me and supplying me with photos of them in costumes or videos of them in, uh, costumes. And then, it, then things really started, uh, rolling. Gotcha. Now, when you're making a documentary like this, I can't help but think that it's not like where you're making a quote unquote regular movie where you've got the script in place and then you put the um, and then you have the actors act it out and then you edit it all together. I would imagine that something like this is you go. I want to make a movie about more or less the rise and fall and maybe rise again of the costume industry and I don't know who I need to talk to and I don't know what I want this to be about. And then when you sit down and you go do all your research, and like you said, you were talking about the Collegeville, was that the name of it? Collegeville and um, Halco. Mm -hmm. When you get the names of those two companies, then you find the names of those people and then you go, okay, let's get them on film and then let's talk about it. Then once you get all that footage in place, is that when you write the script for the narrator? Well, basically, uh, what happened is I had an idea of the story I wanted to tell before going into this. But, you know, it, once you start interviewing people, more pieces of the puzzle come in play. So, um, there, you know, I basically wrote the, the, the story first. And then, um, you know, based on the interview questions, you know, they kind of fit into the story. Uh, there was, uh, you know, a rewrite that we had to do uh, just to incorporate some uh, – some of the other stuff in there uh like the tylenol scare and you know a few other things like that but it was you know it, it was really interesting i guess there, there's multiple ways that you could do it um but yeah this this kind of like I, I had the story in my mind that i wanted to tell you know i wanted to talk about because you know the main factors that kept these things going were licensing you know and uh you know once you once they saw that hey they can make more money selling a batman costume and they can selling a, a skeleton costume you know thing things really started to turn in the industry and uh you know a lots of money started to be th started to get thrown around and uh and, and made gotcha now when you showed these costumes and you're showing all this did you have to get licensing agreements from all of the parent companies of like like specifically now, like if you show Spider-Man in a Batman costume, you've got to reach out to Warner Brothers and uh, DC Comics, or I'm sorry, Warner Brothers and Disney and say, hey, can I uh, show this? Or is it because of like, this is now like, I don't know, public domain, not not really public domain, but this is something that's a little bit different. Uh, I, I mean, right. like, did you, were you at all worried about that? I mean, like showing like, hey, here's a picture of Spider-Man. Well, Disney now well, owns it. Right. These were home, you know, home movies of people in costumes. So because they had purchased the costume and it was shot by them, it was then their property. But I did have to get like, uh, you know, signed off from the people that supplied the videos, uh, allowing me to to use them in the film. Gotcha. And um, when you were doing all this, it seemed like. It seemed like when you go back to those early costumes that what you see like before they started marketing because it was like in the I think you were saying in the night or your, the documentary said that it was like in the 30s and 40s they started going hey why don't we make a Superman costume a Batman costume that type of thing mm -hmm. um, up until then people were like you had your generic witch wizard what like pirate army Devil, guy right. yeah. yeah like real like more spooky darker stuff did you find it fascinating to see how they did the homemade costumes before everything became for lack of a better phrase commercialized 
Yeah, I mean, that was always, it was always really cool to see like what people would come up with by themselves. And, uh, you know, I mean, there, there's, there's tons of stuff that, that people did, and, uh, you know, some of the masks even, you know, back then looked really scary. Um, and, uh, you know, but I mean, because I had such a love for like the Ben Cooper costumes and all that, I really wanted to, you know, focus on that. Cause that, you know, that, that touched generations from basically like the thirties to the nineties. And that, that's like right. such a huge, you know, huge pool of people that have worn those costumes or at least seen those costumes or know people that have because you know back then like everybody had those costumes gotcha now when you were talking like with uh, Ben Cooper and talking along those lines with that costume did you see how there was a big difference between like how in the 1970s you did have your Batman, Superman, Spider-Man type of figures, and I'm comparing it now to the Mego figures that I think you okay. and I probably played with uh, yep. when we were growing up. How things really changed in the 1980s when the 1980s were all about 30-minute commercials for action figures and stuff like that, like Transformers, G.I. <laughs> Joe. Did you see how like the industry just really changed and exploded? Oh, definitely. I mean, it it was pretty cool because in the 80s, you know, cartoons basically took over, you know, I mean, it, it's, you know, it's hard to compete, you know, with, uh, and I mean, you could, you could even say they overtook movies in that era because, cause you had, you know, He-Man, G.I. Joe, Voltron, Transformers, Ninja Turtles, uh, and it was just, you know, it's, it, it, the, the licenses that kept coming out. Uh, you know, made for great costumes, and uh, so so it was really cool to to see that kind of happen. You know, where, where you know seventies it was you know um, more movies and comic books, but the eighties were really a really strong era for cartoons. Right? Was that because you also had like um, you mentioned the alien costume in your? <laughs> um, was there? ever any kind of like hey you know this is really odd like alien is not something that you would bring a nine or ten year old to see <laughs> ideally and if you are you are a bad parent shame on you <laughs> but if you were in that um did you like did you ever find that there was any sort of pushback to ben cooper for wanting to make like a alien costume for a 10 year old or anything like did they ever talk about that like where they got pushback for making certain costumes versus other costumes right well this is the thing so alien was the first costume with rated that that was the first movie that was rated r to receive a halloween costume from cooper so um you know they didn't tell me the details exactly but what i think may have happened is you know at that time you say okay if, if you're you know, you have to sell 200 costumes or whatever. It cuts the cuts the thing in half because remember these are tailored to little kids and and, right. uh, and you know so there there had to be something on that end. But what's but what's cool too is like that costume. Even if I didn't know what it was now as a kid, I'd be like, man, I wanna I wanna get that because it looks really cool. Um, you know, I did speak with Frank Romano about it, who was the artist for Ben Cooper. Um, he's he's actually 95 years old. He's still around. He's a World War II vet, Amazing. and he was actually at the premiere uh, of Halloween in a Box, and, and we got him up, up on stage afterwards, and he talked about like really cool stuff. But um, you know, he said that of course they got that uh, the the picture of Alien prior to uh, you know the movie even coming out or anybody even seeing it. He said they had to keep it like really quiet they they sent them something saying whatever you do you know this is just for internal use don't show it to anyone and uh so so it was pretty cool to kind of hear you know the the story of that that's amazing because i gotta tell you something the the way security is now for these um for a lot of these projects like you know like when uh they wrote the avengers endgame script you know that when they sent that to the different actors that it wasn't just like a like dear robert downey jr please don't tell nobody what's going on in the script sincerely right. everybody in charge now yeah. it's probably 
the same amount of security that they had for nuclear weapons circa 1970s, oh, right. I would think. That yeah, it's yeah. like now, like, okay, put your thumbnail on that, put your thumbprint on this, let me see your retina scan. Uh, now, swear before God or whatever religious being you hold to that you won't say anything to anybody on penalty of death. And then when you read the script, it will then delete itself in 25 minutes or something like that. So whereas mm -hmm. la at this time, it's like, okay, here's a picture of what the alien's going to look like. Don't tell nobody, okay? <laughs> it's a <laughs> little bit different. So uh, It's pretty amazing if you think about it. I mean, it, Alien was like, you know, one of the it could be, you know, the greatest horror movie of all times. So it's uh, it was pretty cool just to see how, uh, you know, how the back then, I guess, relayed information to, to you know, to to the to the costume company. Well, um, another cool story that that was told on there was that the ET costume. Um, I, I found that pretty interesting from College Bill. Is you know they were visiting the studios and they, and they said, you know, what's this movie about? It's a, like it's about an alien, you know, that comes to Earth and we can't, you know, show you what the alien looks like. All you could see is his ET's glowing finger, and you know on that this this company had to decide, okay, are we going to take a chance on this making a costume out of this? We can't even tell what the costume is going to look like, and, right. and you know they uh, they did take a chance and they sold like tons of costumes, uh, as you can imagine, as ET was like a huge movie. Yeah. Well, and then on a side note, for those that saw ET. The ironic thing of all of this is, is that how when you see E.T. actually responding to somebody in a Yoda costume in the movie, <laughs> I don't know if you remember that. And I do, yeah. And then when you find out in The Phantom Menace that there's a group of E.T.'s actually in the Senate jumping up and down, you kind of see why E.T. kind of responded to the Yoda costume in a weird way, like, oh my gosh, it's a friend of mine. How you doing? <laughs> it's so funny. funny. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Now, when you were making this, four years is a long time to be working on a project like this. Did you ever get to those points where you just kind of were like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to give up. I'm ready to just throw in the towel. Or did you ever just get really frustrated at that time? Um, that's a good question. There were there were a few things. Um, you know, I mean, a, a lot of the time I was kind of waiting to receive um, information or, or photos from the Ben Cooper family. Um, and it seemed like for a while that wasn't going to happen. That I, I mean, I know I wanted to put the movie out, but there were things which took a long time to develop in terms of people getting me information. Um, and, and, you know, I really wanted one of my goals was to, which what happened, I wanted to show this movie with Frank Romano there and kind of give him the, the, the credit he deserved for making like, you know, tons of costumes that people wore. Um, you know, throughout Halloween, he was, he was really excited to see it. And, and, uh, you know, he, he's such an amazing artist and it was really cool to, uh, to, to have that experience. Gotcha. Now, when you finally finished it and you got the first cut done, cause from what I understand, there's that, okay, we've got the first cut done and then we add the music and then we add the narration and whatever, I guess like I don't think you're going to be doing too too many effects on this um, right what was that like to finally see that like was it a, was it an emotional experience for you uh, it was really it, it was more it felt like almost like a weight lifted you know what I mean and there were a few last minute things that we needed to uh, to get together after that and uh, but it, it was good to see basically the light at the end of the tunnel at that point Gotcha. Now, was it always like when you're making this movie, was it always the intention? Because I'll flat out tell you, I saw this on the Amazon and um, and uh, and it was one of those when it was like the free with subscription type of things. Did 
did uh-huh. you was it ever your intention of for a wide release or did you always know that this was going to be a um i hate to say the phrase straight to video but do you know what i mean like this was going to be like like it may be in a couple of screens here and there but this was always going to be something that was mostly what people would see on tv through uh services like amazon netflix that type of thing did you know that that's what you you were going to make this for yeah that's kind of what we were shooting for i think that would have the best um chance to reach people in the age group that it that wore these costumes and you know it would get the most kind of eyeballs on the on the um uh, on the uh you know on the on the project i mean you know it's hard uh, most documentaries don't go to like the big screen you know um so that that was really getting getting it picked up was uh was really cool and and seeing it on amazon and, and other streaming platforms was, was really what we were going for so we really achieved our goal when uh when we get it got it out there like that right right um and then like what has been the response been like have you like have, what have people been saying when they finally get a chance to see it well i mean you know it, it's great because we've uh, gotten like a lot of emails from people saying you know thank you so much for helping me relive my childhood um you know i've had people uh you know the, the ben cooper family contacted me and said you know they're really happy to see it and uh so it, it's been really positive you know it's uh you know i made the i made the movie for like people like us that remember these costumes and uh and, and you know had fun wearing them and, and and you know everybody seemed to seem to enjoy it right what was one of the biggest surprises about doing this that you found out um about like the costumes what well, like um obviously yeah you you had mentioned the et thing and the alien thing but um were there ever any surprises about like how um like like did ben did the ben cooper realize family realize just how big the nostalgia is because like i remember hearing stories about um i did an interview one time with larry kenny and he he was a very nice guy who did the voice of uh lion from the thundercats oh cool mm-hmm. and um and he mentioned that he thought that this was doing the thundercats he just thought that this was just a regular job for him like he came in did the voices recorded x number of voices and then said okay i've got to go back to another life and he recorded the voices say circa 84 85 doesn't hear anything from anybody about it until email started becoming a thing and the internet started becoming a thing and gradually people were able to get in touch with him more and more and they would send him things like dear mr kenny my life was terrible but between 4 and 4 30 i felt like i was a family member of the thundercats and oh, that gave awesome. me something to feel positive about did same thing with the with this family with these with with ben cooper and halco did they know how big this stuff meant to people did they have any understanding of that i mean i think they kind of you know i think for them it it was just a business you know yeah they see their their profits as they're selling like hundreds of thousands of costumes but what i found really interesting is is they were kind of amazed that there's a market for those costumes to this day um they they you know ben, uh, bob cooper who was the president of ben cooper inc and ben cooper's son said you know he could kick himself for not seeing the collectability of what they were producing I mean, you know, if you go, I mean, some of these costumes go for a few hundred dollars these days, you know, and they're, they really are like collectibles. And, uh, you know, it's just amazing if, you know, if you go on eBay and you type something in, you could see, you know, Star Wars costumes selling for, you know, maybe 75 to a hundred dollars each, or, or, you know, um, there's different costumes, of course, have different, um, different prices, but, uh, they're, they're really impressed by, you know, even though the companies are long gone, their legacy lives on through through collectability. 
Right, right. So, but the funny thing is, is that if they had like a storeroom with like a bunch of these Star Wars costumes hanging out, that probably could have put the company back in business then, or something <laughs> like like that. I think you're right. That that's for sure. Yeah. Well, with all due respect to the Ben Cooper family, I'm like the artists who made comic books back in the day had no idea that their original comic book art would be worth anything. And so what ended up happening would be is like, okay, oh yeah, we, we did the first issue of some guy called Batman and we're just going to make the artwork and we're just going to put it down on the floor or something like that and let it catch ink or what have you. And oh, it's like, oh man, if they had understood what was going on or, you know, the classic story that we heard growing up, it was like, you know, those people just didn't need their funny books anymore, so mom got rid of yeah. them. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, that's, that's why mom amazing. got put in the home. <laughs> <laughs> so. so, now, as you um, continue doing this, like, like, and I, under, I, I know that you also have some other functions as, like, you have a network dedicated to horror. Am I correct? Yeah. That's right. Uh, we, uh, my wife and I run Horror News Network, and it's a horror news website, and it's similar to, to CNN. News gets updated, uh, you know, as it happens on the site, and we have a staff of, um, you know, of, of, of a team of people that have been with the site, you know, some over ten years, and so we've been doing this for quite some time. And uh, also, we have a um, a horror convention in Connecticut that we run. It's called Connecticut Horror Fest, and and last year we just had uh, Pinhead and the Cenobites, as well as the cast of Saw. So we had Tobin Bell and Shawnee Smith, and we mixed in a few other people as well in there. So it's uh yeah we're definitely uh you know trying to keep the horror ball rolling here. Gotcha. I actually was thinking just on my own, would you guys ever have any interest in starting a Halloween? Um, would you guys ever have any interest in starting a Halloween um, museum someplace that collects these costumes and stuff or collects photos of something like this? I know you've I, got a billion things to do, but I thought that would just be such a great thing to be someplace where we can go and and see like, oh, wow, there's a Batman costume circa 1940 and there's one circa 1960 and circa 1980 type of thing. That, that would be awesome. The only thing, you know, of course, is, you know, rent on places and, and, and you know, the, the retail space, at least up here in Connecticut, is is just, you know, through the stratosphere. It, it's just the prices are crazy. I mean, if, you know, who knows, maybe one day there'll be something where people could fl- – something like that. But I would imagine would probably work best in New York or California with the amount of people – you know, visiting, but that would definitely be cool to, uh, to, to see someday. Gotcha. Yeah. Cause like it would make sense for you guys to be the ones that do it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so. that would be off. Yeah, that would be. Um, and what is next for you? Um, well we have, you know, I mean, we we're going through a few things that we're looking at doing next. Um, I actually am waiting to the to the end of the year. I'm working on um, a script or two that I hope to finish, and then you know look into um, look into to producing something next. So um, yeah, I mean we're we're definitely working on some projects. What it's going to be is kind of up in the air. We're still fleshing them out, but um, yeah, we hope to uh, hope to have something out in the next year or two. That's awesome. Well. I got to tell you, I have really enjoyed our conversation. I think this has been a lot of fun, and it, and I think your project is great. Now, can people people get a chance to they um, they can obviously see it on Amazon for the time being um, right. if they are Prime subscribers. But um, is there a place where they can people can buy the DVD? And would you actually consider autographing the DVD if they buy it from you? Um, well, this is so 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 far. We don't have any plans for a DVD release. There are oh, clips okay. in there that have been clips in there that have been licensed, and uh, the licensed clips only allow for digital download. Okay. But uh, and sure, you know, it's it would probably be up to the distributor, um, you know, if if they wanted to plan a, a DVD release on it. But I think it would be cool. You know, I'd be behind it. I would just have to wait 
and uh, hear from the distributor, which is Indie Rights, to see if they, uh, you know, they'd be interested in in releasing that. Gotcha. What about plans for at least a Halloween in a box T-shirt or something like that? Uh, that would be cool. You know, we have the um, we we originally our poster was made by Jeff Zorno. We actually uh, sold out of a bunch of them. Um, you know, we may may look into doing uh, more posters and and potentially a T-shirt. Gotcha. That's really cool. Well, I got to tell you, Rob, I really have enjoyed the chat. I think I, it was a great book. I or not great book. It was a great movie. I really enjoyed it, and it was just something just to kick back. And I saw pictures of 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 costumes I used to wear and I would go, Oh my gosh, I remember that. And I remember how terrible those masks were and the elastic <laughs> band that constantly came out. <laughs> that oh, was always man. the one downside of that stuff. So it was, it was, it was always a struggle. I tell you that much. Yeah, exactly. So, but Rob, I really have enjoyed it. And if people want to get in touch with you or, um, or find out about what you're doing, you said that, um, the best way to do it is, let me see hnnproductions.net am I correct? That's right yep so they could visit the website we have a contact form on there and they could fill it out and, and shoot us a message. Gotcha and you guys are, it seem like you're pretty good about getting back in touch with people aren't you? Yeah we try to you know get back to everybody as soon as we can and, and uh, you know I mean because we're just happy that people are finding interest in this and hopefully it could just take them back to a simpler time and, and just let them relive their youth for like an hour and a half. Gotcha. Yeah, because that's been that's been like some of the fun of this and everything. You know what? Before I before we go, I gotta tell you, there's always been one thing that has always bugged me about Halloween costumes. Is is that, that you've got the ones that are kind of like say you've got like a regular superhero, a regular <laughs> superhero costume where you've got something like Batman or Superman where it is it actually resembles the very uniform that Batman wears when he's fighting crime. But then you've right. got some things like Alf, where it's just basically a funny costume with a picture of Alf on the chest and then a mask <laughs> that looks like Alf instead of it being all like, hey, let's like make a brown bodysuit that looks yeah. like it's got tufts of hair in that. And that always bugged me when I was growing up. It was just like, come on, why can't you make... Your give the kids an actual elf costume yeah i mean that that's funny because a lot of the 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 costumes were like that too it could be like a green lantern costume but a picture of green lantern on the front instead of like his symbol it was pretty crazy but yeah i mean i guess that's some of like the the nostalgia of those costumes just like how zany they were as well yeah where it's just like like oh hey look it's a picture of like like instead of being a ghost costume like you know where you have a picture of a white someone in like a white sheet with the holes cut out or something like that it's basically give the kid a white mask and then a bodysuit that just has a picture of a ghost that says I'm a ghost and it was like a lot of these had to be spelled right out like hey yeah. I'm Batman I'm Superman that type of thing I was, that was, it was almost ridiculous yeah. but, but, but it was cool I guess it's some of the nostalgia of those things but. right right gotcha well listen Rob I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight this has just been a lot of fun and it was just really great to hear how you did what you did and how you got into it so i want to thank you again for being a part of this thank you so much this was really fun and best of luck with your show thank you very much and uh rob uh i'm gonna hold you to something i'm gonna put you on the spot i'm gonna hold you to something next time you have a new project coming out or you want to wave a banner about something i insist that you reach out to me so that we can give you some press for it as if you don't have your own news network to publish it well, I appreciate that, and I'll definitely, uh, I'll, I'll definitely keep you to that. So, awesome, Rob. Thank you so much for joining us. We have been on the phone with Rob Caprolozzi, the director of this wonderful documentary called Halloween in a Box. Go check it out. It's currently available on Amazon.com if you are a Prime member, and it is just a lot of fun. At the very least, go to YouTube and check out the trailer. Like his Facebook page and just kick back and enjoy. 
with that said, I want to thank everyone for enjoying me tonight, and thank you for uh, joining us for Conversations of the Strange. I'm Don Smith.